My name is Laura Thomas. I'm a candidate for district attorney. A year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I turned to my husband and said, I'm going to run for district attorney. And he said, what if you lose? And I said, what if I don't run? Uh, this office needs a leader. This is the first time in 36 years this has been an open position. The last four of our five DAs were appointed by the governor and ran as incumbents. So this is the first opportunity we've had in a long time to actually run based on experience and merit and the opportunity. And that's important to us because the district attorney needs to lead. I've been a district attorney in the, as an assistant in the office since 1987, starting right here in Guthrie. When I talked, I didn't just say I'm going to run and decide, I talked to people. I talked to the people that meant a great deal to me and who I respected. I talked to Rob Hudson. I talked to Frank Davis. I talked to my God to ask him if I was choosing the right path and journey and made the decision to run. And it's exciting to run because of what you can bring to the district attorney's office. The district attorney is more than just the prosecutor of criminal cases. That is a primary function, but the district attorney can do so much more. One of the things that I really want to do with the office is expand our reach into the community. I want to expand a focus on crimes against the vulnerable. And the vulnerable for us are children and the elderly because those are victims whose voices are either silent or muted because it, they're difficult to find them and let them be heard. So I want to expand outreach through education of the elderly as to what financial exploitation and, and abuse is so they have an avenue and their caretakers have an avenue to report it. I've run the child support program in these two counties for a number of years and have increased child support collections that go directly back to the families of Payne and Logan County over 158% since 2000. Last year alone, we collected $9.635 million that went all completely back to families in Payne and Logan County. That's huge because if you can remove a family from poverty, you can affect the crime level. That is near and dear to my heart. I will keep the child support program. The district attorney in these two counties has always managed the child support program. We now have two offices, one in Guthrie and one in um, Stillwater. Today I brought with me the people who matter to me so much and are my support base, and that is my husband, George, who we call the sign man, my oldest daughter, Darcy, and a lot of my campaign team, this is Laura Clark, who's originally from Clark Crescent over here, who is actually the designer of much of my information, Becky Jones and Laura Welch, who keep me in track, tell me where to go, who to talk to, and what to say, and what not to do. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to people and tell them what we are about. Many people just think of the district attorney's office as the place where you go to file charges. And it's so much more than that. Last year alone, the, in Payne and Logan County, we filed 1,400 felonies and 2,900 misdemeanors. And that does not include the thousands and thousands of traffic tickets. So the point of those is to resolve them where we're protecting the community and at the same time, preventing future criminal behavior. So it's all about education, and the district attorney has to be a partner in the community. We can't just sit in our office and prosecute cases. We need to reach out, we need to establish programs with the resources we already have that reaches more victims of crime and provides more avenues for victims of crime. I appreciate the time, thank you. Thank you, Laura. My name is Jack Warrior, and I'm also a candidate for the district attorney's position of Payne in Logan County. 
a little bit of my background. I started basically education in law enforcement in 1971. I have an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree in law enforcement. I have been a police officer. I have been an assistant chief of police. I have been a city attorney. I have been a city judge. And more importantly, I have been with the District Attorneys Association for 22 years, not only in Tulsa County, in Payne County, but in Logan County now. As such, again, thank you all for inviting both of us here. I do appreciate that for this forum. And as such, I have my family, uh, my wife Linda and my youngest son uh, present, uh, Linda Boyer and Michael Boyer, and they're behind me as well. Now, this whole situation with the district attorney's race is this. There n does need to be leadership in the district attorney's office, but a district attorney, besides prosecuting cases, needs to be in the pit to know what's going on in the courtroom to adequately advise their subordinates, the assistant district attorney, and the staff as far as what's going on and the policy. Now, there are several goals that I have as a candidate for assistant district, uh, as for district attorney. And, and one of those goals is I want to shorten the time between the occurrence of the crime and the time the case is over, whether that's resolved through plea negotiations or whether that's resolved by trial. Victims need to be made whole, and it doesn't matter, senior victims, children victim, they need to be made whole as soon as possible. And something that takes two years to even get to trial is ridiculous. Uh, shorten the time. I also want to expand awareness of victims of domestic abuse. Domestic abuse victims, they're either emotionally or physically harmed through a person that lives with them, a spouse. This cycle of violence needs to change. The victims need to be educated. The victim need to have therapy sessions if necessary to address the emotional trauma. Emotional trauma can last years after a physical trauma. A cut will heal a person's mind that's a victim of, of an offense. They're still thinking about it years later. Through counseling and therapy, perhaps that would aid and assist in their recovery on the matter. The other thing is uh, when people are injured either emotionally, physically, there's restitution involved. Restitution is utmost besides the well-being of the victim emotionally, restitution needs to be addressed quickly. And if somebody writes a hot check or runs into your car when they're DUI, there's a $5,000 restitution payment. It is ridiculous to have that payment at $25 a month. That takes forever. That does not put the victim home. I'm an avid supporter and I've been involved in the Payne and Logan County drug court system for 17 years. People who are drug dependent and or addicts need to receive treatment rather than going to prison. But there comes a point where enough is enough. And you have three or four time felony convictions and that person progresses through the stages of a random casual user to being addicted to uh, stealing property so that they can go out and afford their drugs or they get into the selling of the drugs on the trafficking. Trafficking is such that if you have over a certain quantity, you're going to prison. I believe that I have support from law enforcement in both Payne and Logan counties. And while my opponent might have more experience with murder trials, 
There is no person, no attorney in this county or in Payne County that's had more jury trial experience than I have. None. Am I getting close? Thank you for your support. You guys have some good questions coming up. So the first question that we have, and I'll read, Laura, I believe you're up for the first question. Please describe your experience in prosecuting um, murder cases. I'm the only candidate in this race who has ever prosecuted a murder case. And a district attorney needs to have prosecuted the worst of the crimes. Um, I prosecuted about 15 first degree murder cases. I'm one of only two attorneys in Payne County who has ever received the death penalty verdict from a jury. Murder cases are the worst of the cases because they rip the people apart. And this is a case where you will never make the victim or the victim family whole. So what you do is try to gently take them through a very hostile and unfriendly system. Um, my first murder case was right here in Logan County in 1987, where a young guy murdered and raped a girl who was moving to Colorado the very next day to start her very first teaching position. That was our first case. He will never get out of prison. The cases that are nearest and dearest to me have been child homicides, and I've become an expert at child homicides. And again, the worst I've ever had is in Logan County of a man who beat, stomped, and shook a two-year-old to death, and the mother supported him. So murder cases are where you remove the worst of the worst from society. My murderers will never get out of prison. The families will never recover from the murder. But that's what leadership is, and that's what district attorneys do. We develop victim witness programs that take victims through the system that provide them with resources, that provide them with a safe haven, that hold their hand, who cry with them and who pray with them. We remain with those victims for my entire career. I've still been in contact with the victims' families. Um, you don't just go in a DA's office and start trying a murder case. You have to build your skill level up before you can attempt to try a murder case. It's not like trying a speedy ticket. It's not like when you ask 12 people to consider giving someone the death penalty, it takes years of skill, trial, advocacy. And that's one of the things I bring to the table that no other candidate can. Thank you. Your question is please describe your experience in prosecuting murder cases. My experience in prosecuting uh, murder cases has been involved in the fringe and on the research. I have been second chair involved in one. Laura has me beat hands down as far as that. And there's no question and no doubt if that's concerned. But in order to prosecute any type of case, the burden of proof that the state of Oklahoma has to prove is beyond a reasonable doubt. And ladies and gentlemen, beyond a reasonable doubt on a speeding ticket, you still have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Murder cases are much more complicated. You have the medical examiner, you have the officers involved, but I'm here to tell you, Laura has more experience in trying murder cases than I do but I have more trial experience. Thank you. Okay, Jack, you'll be speaking first. Next question. Describe your management experience within the district attorney's office. 
my management experience within the district attorney's office has been has started in Tulsa County. I was a team captain with the Tulsa County District Attorney's Office in child of uh, in sport uh, child sport misdemeanors, felony DUI cases, uh, cases involving mental health, cases involving child abuse, as well as juvenile deprived cases or juvenile delinquent cases. And as such, I had a team of nine attorneys that were working underneath me and several support staff. We went to trial a lot in Tulsa County. Now, in Payne and Logan County, I have been involved with the Juvenile Division in Stillwater. I was head of the Juvenile Division, had one support person and other uh, subordinates that aided and assisted in the uh, child support, not child support, but the child uh, laws involving deprived and delinquents. Over here in Guthrie, uh, well, strike that start with. I was also the director of the Dr District 9 Drug Task Force for approximately nine years. All the agents that were recruited from Logan County and Payne County were uh, directly under my supervision whether what they were doing. Am I still doing good on time? Yeah, about two seconds. Okay. <laughs> and as such, uh, uh, management of personnel I've had private practice, had three attorneys working for me when I was in private practice, and a support staff of five. Thank you. Laura, the question is, describe your management experience within the district attorney's office. I started at the bottom and worked my way up. I believe in what General Norman Schwarzkopf and Donald Ronsfeld always say. Before you can lead, you have to follow. And my 30 years of trial experience and 27 for the people in Payne and Logan County, I followed. And then I led. And leadership is not easy. I managed two child support divisions that involved 14 staff and $9.6 million in child support and a budget slightly under $1 million, appropriated by the legislature and DHS. We hire, we fire, we train, we evaluate people and programs. That's what I do. Because Stillwater and Guthrie are two of the top performing child support offices in the state, other child support programs literally came to us, their DA did, their boss did, and said, can you fix my program because it does not perform well. We have gone into five child support offices completely analyze their programs, their processes, their people, their management skills, and change them, and took them from being low-performing offices to top-performing offices. It is the same thing in the criminal division of the district attorney's office. Tom Lee, two months ago, called me over to the office, he's our outgoing DA, and said, I have a program here that's not performing as I want it to perform. It's not bringing in the money it's supposed to bring in. Can you help me fix it? We evaluated what the issues were. We determined if there were personnel issues or process issues or procedure issues, and there were all three. I gave him one of my staff members because he asked me to, and that program has now rebounded and is performing at a top level. I've had experience all the way from the misdemeanors to the felonies. I manage people, I manage money. The district attorney's budget last year was $3.3 million. $800,000, $850,000 of that was child supports. Those are appropriated and non-appropriated and grant funds. I know how to manage it because Tom Lee has brought me in and taught me his budget also. So I'm prepared to leave the office. You're actually Okay. This. High tech stuff. <laughs> we have many repeat offenders in the system. What do you plan to do with this uh, career criminal? Remove them. 
and hopefully keep them removed from society. That's one of my focus areas, the career criminal. They make me very angry because when you have a career criminal, that means we've started in the court system, and I can promise you in the court system, you start, unless it's horribly serious, you start with probation. You start with terms of probation that are designed to detour your criminal behavior and fix whatever problem you have. So I'm painting Logan County on nonviolent offenses. If you end up going to prison, it's because you've literally broke into prison. So when you have repeat offenders, it means they have violated every court order that a judge has sat there and said, you will do this, and they stood there and they said, yes, Your Honor, I will do that. And then they didn't do it. They cannot be trusted, and they need to be removed from society because they steal, they drain our resources, they drain our court time, they harm our community, and they violate our property rights. And I don't want them to do five years with 20 suspended. I want them to do 30 years with none suspended. And maybe the prison system will keep them 10 of those years. So they need to be removed from society. question is, we have many repeat offenders in the system. What do you plan to do with the career criminal? As Ms. Thomas has indicated, repeat offenders are serious offenders. They gradually wake, work their way up and they have three or four felony convictions. That's mandatory prison time. Mandatory percent to Oklahoma State law. However, there are occasions where uh, people are habitual drug offenders and they've never received whether they went to prison or for, before or not but they've never received the drug treatment. District Attorney's Office is also about justice and what's the right thing to do. Some of these people need drug treatment. If they can't get it in prison that's why drug court is a necessary element. If a person has three or four, you, the first offense is possession of marijuana. That's a misdemeanor. Carries up to a year in prison. Second, subsequent marijuana possession carries up to two to ten years. Now, are you going to put somebody for a second possession of pot in prison? No. But if they have three or four of those, are you going to send them to prison? You're going to seriously think about that because those folks haven't got the message. That's why it's important that the drug court program offer the opportunity to get some treatment for these offenders. Serious offenders that have two or three uh, felony convictions in the background, they need to go to prison. But not only do they need to go to prison, what I also do is keep them in prison. And as such, a motion for judicial review a motion for post-conviction relief or a motion for commutation of sentence is something that I deal with on a weekly basis. And not only after I send them to prison, of course the judge is the one that makes the judgment, but when those people either through trial or through plea negotiation go to prison, I also keep them there. You'll actually have the last question. Okay. You'll go first in responding to the question. The question is, how will you enforce school attendance for the children whose parents don't value education? Very easily. And that's what I've started in Logan County. Uh, my staff in Logan County, we have started with the school system giving a uh, discussions and input from the school system locally and have requested input and when kids are absent for school for 10 days and it doesn't have to be consecutive days but when they're absent from school and that unexcused I've started a program here pursuant to state law that the school sends out a letter if nothing happens we send out a letter and then a week later I file charges there are numerous charges sitting over on my desk that when mom or dad are too drunk 
or they're too lazy or they're too intoxicated through narcotics that they don't try to aid their children in at least getting to school, those parents need to be held accountable. And as such, uh, there have been several cases that have started in the prosecution process at this point, and that's because I want to make sure that starting the next school year, that every parent out there knows that they're responsible for the education of their children. And if they can't be responsible, then perhaps Department of Human Services needs to be involved or law enforcement needs to be involved because, look, everybody that's in this room, sooner or later, we're going to age out and it's going to be the younger people. And the younger people need to have that education to aid and assist everyone. Thank you. This is a very difficult problem that keeps growing and simple prosecution of the parent is not going to solve the problem because now we are on second and third generation of parents who do not value education and when you do not value education you don't send your children to school you don't teach them the value of education in child support, we see this every day. We see countless mothers with multiple children from different fathers, all without the benefit of marriage, and they live on the system because they were never taught there was a choice or choices in your life. So what my child support staff and I have done is gone into schools. We go into the family life planning schools and we teach them the realities of the situation of what your life will be like without an education and how difficult it is to make it. Prosecuting a parent for misdemeanors, all fine and good, you can give them a fine, you can say do five days in jail and they'll do it in 24 hours. That's not going to make their children go to school. You have to go into the schools. That's part of the partnership and outreach that a district attorney needs to be in the community. They are a powerful voice. They can use that voice to educate and impact future behavior. And the way we do that with compulsory education is go into the school and teach the at-risk kids who are children of parents who don't value education. You teach them they have choices and the way to exercise them is through education. It doesn't cost us any more money. It's my staff and it's on our time. The teachers welcome our input because teachers care about children just like we do. So my intervention would be a little different. It would go to the root of the problem and try to solve that. There. I know I'm a new face and a new name to many of you. And I thought I'd take this opportunity to introduce myself really on a more personal level. And I think uh, you'll have a little bit of insight as to where I stand on a lot of issues, which we're obviously going to get to in the Q&A uh, later. I think you'll know. That's not loud enough. Is that better? I was just telling Jennifer it sounds worse than my mother's cell phone, which she dropped in a stock tank. She thinks talking louder will make me hear her better. <laughs> so anyway, on that personal level, I'm going to jump back and hit some of the, the key places that have kind of formed me as an individual. And we're going to jump back all the way to a rural hospital in the 1960s in northern Oklahoma. A uh, Native American male nurse was on duty one evening. You didn't see those very often in those days. And a young mother came in to give birth to her second child. And she wasn't waiting. The child wasn't waiting. The doctor had already gone home for the evening. And that Native American male nurse, he knew because of his ethnicity and because he was male during those times that, that he might have to face some consequences for stepping up and doing what he knew was right. But he stepped up and he delivered that baby. It, uh, it did turn out that uh, down the road, the word got around, and, and because of, of who he was, 
he did end up losing his job, but I spoke to him just a few years back. He doesn't regret it a, for one moment because he stepped up and he did what was right and he helped someone. And he went on to become a successful business owner, uh, mayor of a small town, and an all around great guy. That birth also brought about one of our long, longest standing family traditions of not starting our furnace until the end of October for money reasons. Uh, and because the doctor refused to release me from the hospital to go home to the $40 a month farmhouse on a dirt road that my parents had just rented that had no heat. They installed a open flame propane heater which thankfully the windows were so loose that the wind went through the house and washed all the carbon monoxide out. As I, as I became of school age, my brothers and I, we lived out on that dirt road and, and no school would send a bus to come pick us up. And my mother worked at home and uh, she found a, a, a Christian school, a K through six Christian school that said, you know what, we'll come get your boys, we'll give them an education and uh, you, you pay us what you can when you can. We never could have afforded a private education like that. I had 13 kids graduating with me in the sixth grade, so I came from a small place. As I, I gained a little bit of years, I uh, started seeing everything in red, white, and blue. The bicentennial was coming. It probably is what endeared the United States of America into my heart, what made me such a patriot. It was everywhere, especially Evil Knievel's helmet. On through those years, um, my parents, they separated as parents often do. One now lives on one side of town, one lives on the other. My mother took the opportunity when we got a little bit older to pursue her education. Um, she now has a, a PhD in veterinary parasitology, just retired from Oklahoma State University to raise longhorn cattle on the bluegrass prey overlooking Beaver Creek up north of ways. My dad still working at the same job he got when I was one years old in a petroleum related manufacturing facility and he owns and operates and coaches the Junior Rifle Club and is co-sponsor of the Friends of the NRA banquet every year up in his hometown. I went on to college, uh, graduated from Oklahoma State University working often two and three jobs at a time to put myself through college. I uh, wound up with a bachelor's degree in 1988 and not technically but enough hours to get a minor in business law. I used my education from Oklahoma State a lot more than I used my degree from Oklahoma State. I entered into the business world. I began flipping houses before the term flipping houses was even commonly used. I've started, I've bought businesses, operated them, sold them, almost all of them for profit. I'm an entrepreneur by heart. I find my own way and I make my own way. I have uh, an amazing wife, Jessica, six wonderful children. My second son, Triton, was born five years ago. That's how I wound up in this amazing area that I live now. At birth, he was uh, well, they didn't know what was wrong with him. They flighted him to OU Children's. Put my entire world, turned on a dime. Our entire world was just in a, a whirlwind. We did what any family, well, we, we would hope any family would do is we bonded together, we packed up, and we moved to be closer to the medical facilities that um, could handle his needs. We okay on time? In anyway, we'll get to the q and I'm getting run out on time. I could talk for a little bit longer. Um, but I'm glad to be in Logan County. And thank you very much. I'll give my time up. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jason Murphy. Mr. Muchmore has warned me that the clock is fast, so I want to make this quick. 
one of the things that I can vividly recall being a volunteer for the Republican cause back 15 years ago or so was seeing those office holders who would come and talk to our groups just like today and I can remember just sometimes figuring out that here we were the volunteers who worked so hard to elect them and to make a difference because of our shared values and principles in which we all believe and you could see it in those office holders eyes that something had changed that once they had become elected and become a part of government that they became different people and you could sense it and you can feel it and you can know it in your heart that they didn't share those same values and principles anymore even though they still had that R out by their name and were in fact a Republican office holder. And I can remember one meeting in Crescent where one of our Republican senators came and talked to us about the importance of his proposal to increase the state's gas tax. And here we were at a Republican meeting, enthused, young volunteers wanting to make a difference and here our Republican senator at the time way back at the time, 2002-ish, was talking to us about a new tax. And there was just something that felt so wrong about that. And so a few years later, when it was my turn to volunteer and step up for that temporary period of time to be an office holder, I wanted to keep the spirit of our values and principles in my heart and not let that big monster, that perfect monster of big government, change that outlook and those views. And to that end, one of my main focuses as a state representative has been how can we cut the size of government, cut the cost of government, and then advocate for reducing the impact of government on the taxpayer's pocketbook through the form of tax reduction. And I figured out that that's not always the most glamorous work and sometimes it's the hardest because anywhere you try to reduce the size of government spending by a dollar, there's going to be opposition almost universally in some quarters. And so early on, I was able to work on a key reform known as uh, the, reforming the state's purchasing system, reforming the way the state spent money. And we passed the reform to modernize and make it more efficient so that we could save money. But one of the key parts of that reform was a reporting requirement on the bureaucracy that they would have to report back to us consistently about if they were really saving money or not. So each year they submitted that report. And last legislative interim, less than a year ago, our state official in charge of purchasing came before a committee on which I was chairing and testified that those savings now are expected to reach $25 million a year to state and local government. One of the areas where we know there is a tremendous amount of government waste is in administrative overhead. We know that Oklahoma has hundreds of agencies, boards, and commissions. So in addition to advocating for process ref reform, I was really privileged a few years back to start talking about consolidating those government entities. And so on behalf of the Speaker of the House at the time, we put together this proposal that actually took five whole government agencies and combined them into one. It was successful, and the estimates have shown that it's freed up six million dollars a year that otherwise could have been wasted. Between four and six, we were aiming for six. And it's been so exciting to hear the testimony of how unnecessary office space that was being leased at your expense no longer has to be leased. How employees that before were siloed into duties where they just didn't have enough work to do now have the opportunity to do more work because they can actually access that array of offerings as opposed to being siloed within one agency. A couple of years back, we were able to work on the governor's proposal which consolidated boards and commissions in Oklahoma and actually resulted in consolidating 10% of those boards and commissions. It was a neat day when the publication that lists Oklahoma's boards and commissions came out and it was 14 pages lighter than its predecessor. That was 14 pages of government entities. They're not on the books anymore. That's a big deal. And so as we look forward to this election and going forward, my commitment to you is that I will continue working on those processes to save taxpayer dollars and make issues such as tax reform and tax reduction possible. Thank you for your attention. And I have to uh, apologize to Representative Mur Murphy. I did not acknowledge your title. Thank you. All right, the question uh, will go to Mr. Muchmore. You were the first candidate to speak, so you'll get the first question. Besides capital murder, do you believe 
And would you author a bill to make any other crimes eligible for the death penalty, such as pedophilia? Well, that's direct and to the point. I am a proponent of the death penalty for capital murder. I believe someone who is convicted of such a heinous crime should face those consequences. Taking it beneath that, pedophilia, as horrific as that is, I believe the consequences should be as harsh as we can make them, but taking it to the death penalty doesn't fall within my beliefs of an eye for an eye. I don't think that I could get there with pedophilia. So if that is the question, my direct answer is no. I think there are a lot of legislators who would look at that as an option um, because, of course, there are certain crimes that all but take a person's life. They ruin their life forever. And that in, in certain cases, having that on the books for a jury to look at, I think a lot of legislators would be supportive of it, including myself. But I think there are probably um, Supreme Court issues, and perhaps our DA candidates could have weighed in more on this, that I think these laws have been proposed in states, but they probably hit some of that court side where there are certain barriers that make it impossible to move forward. And that's why I think you've probably seen those bills a generation ago, 15, 20 years, and I suspect the court system has, has invalidated them. Representative Murphy, Murphy, this will be your question to speak first. Where do you stand on the legislation of hemp or weed? Legalization of marijuana, um, I'm opposed to it. That's a good answer. On the legalization of marijuana, you hear so many different arguments. Uh, and it, the ones that I hear seem to be from the guys who want to smoke the marijuana. And they want to convince me that I should have a recycled shirt made out of hemp because it's what George Washington grew and made ropes out of. Uh, the legalization of marijuana, I am not for that, no. This question will go to Mr. Muchmore first. Did you have any contact with the State Chamber of Commerce as far as deciding to run? And this question was also posed to Representative Murphy. Any contact with the State Chamber? I have a stack of unopened pack mail that started coming within days of me filing. Uh, most of it's unopened. Uh, there are some phone calls from the state, yeah. Uh, I've, I've spoken briefly with them to the point that I'm not really interested in speaking much more with them. Uh, I did open one letter after they sent me two or three and found out that I have been endorsed by them even though I haven't spoken with them. So that's the extent of my contact with the state chamber. I think that one thing that many of us oftentimes run across in, in the venue that we do is that the chamber has become so dominated by lobbyists and special interests that sometimes when we hold the line against those special interests consistently, and I'm talking about the state chamber, some of the, the big business lobbyists that want some of the corporate welfare programs that oftentimes fiscal conservatives vote against, um, they have a pretty powerful voice there. And so I'll have to be the first to admit I'm not always their most popular choice as a candidate. However, in, a, in a, many areas, we do agree on issues. Workman's comp reform, tort reform. I carried a major judicial reform bill that ended up being their bill this year and one of their, mo their most highly prized ones. And so 
at this, at this, I would say about 60 to 70 percent of the time, those core issues um, I will agree with the chamber on. But I think there are some now that dominate the, some of the committees who can't see past the 30 percent that involve, say, corporate welfare or tax handouts to those who have the special interest that can leverage them. And that's your taxpayer dollar. And sometimes that minority voice becomes the majority voice, and it's not representative of our values at all. And I think their challenge as an institution is to look past that and to work past that. And I'm hoping that they'll do that, that pretty soon because their reputation within legislative circles is absolutely terrible these days. And it's made it hard to move real reforms that need to be moved if they're viewed as supporting them. I'm uh, getting uh, comments that we're having difficulty hearing us. If we need to speak a little louder. Uh, the last question, Representative Murphy, why are uh, so many state statutes considered a gray area? Are the statutes law or not? Okay, so one of the things that I found really interesting was every 10 years the new laws are issued. And when the 2011 statutes books came out, I put them on my desk. And then I went and got the 2010 ones off the shelf. I put them on the desk. 2010, 2011. It's frightening. There were that many new laws in 10 years' time. It results in what I call a tyranny of laws, where one law contradicts another law, maybe intentionally so. And when that happens, the only people that win are the ones who can afford the high-priced attorneys, who can t stake out a position debating which law really applies. And in some cases, it's intentional design. It's where politicians and lobbyists have gotten together and they've passed a new law that intentionally undoes another law that doesn't remove that law from the books. They put it somewhere else and the idea is so when the politicians are voting on the bill, they can't look at the bill and say, oh, you're repealing that old law. No, that what's going to happen is the attorneys are going to interpret the most recently passed law as being the law to follow. So there are two conflicting laws on the books and when we go on OSCN or whatever and read them, we're thinking, why doesn't this law apply anymore? Well, there's a law passed recently, the original law wasn't removed, an absolute tyranny of laws results, which really just favors those who can hire the very capable attorney who can argue either position based on however he wants to argue it. The average taxpayer just lives under a tyranny of laws, any number of laws that can be enforced on them, and they have no way to defend themselves because they don't have the financial resources to do so. And so one of the major efforts we started looking at, and I was a, a part of this year, was the effort to repeal old and antiquated laws. We started that effort, we just scratched the surface, and we weren't always successful. Sometimes the most obvious laws that needed to go away, we couldn't get the political strength to take them away. I can remember one law being a definition of the word paper. We took it to committee, and opposition was there instantly. We couldn't remove the definition of the word paper from the law. It was absolutely amazing. But that's another story for another time. Thank you. We repeat the question. The question is, why are so many state statutes considered a gray area? Are the statutes law or not? And then you can speak up. All like Jason was saying, 100 plus years of laws stacked up back to back with without adequate house cleaning uh, as they go along from session to session. Uh, it, it can be a mess in, it, in the interpretation of, of one law versus a previous law that relates to it that was never even linked to it can, can be a nightmare and, and people get into that twilight zone and, and try to determine, of course they're on the books, they're laws, they can be um, newer laws that address those that's, that take them off the books yet they're still there. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough, tough mess to try to swim through and uh, getting on the road to the house cleaning is going to be a tedious and messy job but it certainly needs to be done. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to start by saying thank you very much to the Logan County Republican women and to the, um, I'm sorry, the first capital Republican women in the Logan County GOP for uh, this morning and to then sigh. <sighs>
a great big sigh of relief because this event has been marked on my calendar because it, it shows that we're nearing the end of this process. And I think we're all ready to see it be over. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, it is a be, uh, definitely a pleasure to be standing before you as your state senator and to have had the honor and the privilege to represent the 20th district of the state of Oklahoma at the state capitol um, for the last two years. I want to start by introducing my team. Um, we're going to start with my family, my husband Trey, if you stand up, and my daughter, my oldest daughter, Alexandra. Um, Reagan is at the house. She and friends uh, went camping down by the lake last night. She has a mess to clean up, so we left her at home. I also am very privileged today to have with me my grandmother-in-law, Eunice Griffin. Um, matriarch of our family uh, and the remainder of my team um, on the campaign trail I have uh, my campaign assistant Lori White who one of my former students who I, you, once you're a teacher you stay a teacher forever she asked me she says I want to learn about this process and I said well come along you can help me and you can learn while you're doing that and then if you've ever had the privilege of calling my office the wonderful woman that answers the phone Kathy Barton my executive assistant and she solves many of your problems before I ever even know that they exist. Well, we're here today to talk about the role of your state senator. And I've had that privilege for the last couple of years, and I'm asking for you to give it to me for four more, because we still have some things that I think I need to accomplish, and some messages that you have sent with me that need to go back to the state capitol. Now, this process of running for office, Laura will probably attest to this, is a little bit like an out-of-body experience. You're not really sure who has control of your life whenever you're doing this. But I'm going to tell you that whenever I'm doing the job, I'm firmly in control. And I am being your voice at the state capitol. The 20th district of the state of Oklahoma is a fantastic place. It spreads from the plains of the western part of Kingfisher County all the way to the rolling hills and the wooded areas near the Keystone Lake in the eastern edge of Pawnee County. It contains some of the most amazing communities in the state of Oklahoma, Guthrie, Perry, Hennessy, Turleton, probably never heard of that one, Hallett. These are amazing places full of wonderful people and my job is to protect the way of life that all 75,000 people consider important and I believe that I have done that all 75,000 people now I'm the incumbent in this race which means that my opponent's job is to attack me and attack my record and quite frankly he's done a great job of it but he's right on a couple of things gotten a couple of votes wrong out of the 4,500 that I've cast in the last two years. He's right. And he's right. There's a couple of areas where we just flat out disagree. And he's also correct that the Monday morning quarterbacks, they evaluate what we do in the state legislature after we've already finished it. I don't always agree with them either. Now when you pull back the curtain of what I do at the state capitol, there is not a Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. There is no one pulling the string. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see is what you get. I'm an Oklahoma girl, grew up in Mays County, Oklahoma, married my husband after college at Oklahoma State, chose to make this community our home and have worked my tail off for over 20 years to make Oklahoma Guthrie, and now the four counties of the 20th district, the very best place to live, work, raise a family, and start a business. And I need to continue to do that on your behalf. There is no puppet master. You get me. Flaws and all. Trey, Alex, would you guys please distribute that? Now my opponent is going to attack my record, and he's right on a couple of things. He's going to refer to a couple of votes that I have made. My family's going to distribute some data, some documents that either I'll refer to as we continue to answer questions, or you can use later and ask me about those later. I'm not finished. There are still voices across this district that need to be heard. I understand fully the role of government in this state. We have a constitution, the U.S. Constitution, that says five things should happen in government. Now, our constitution is actually very simple, but those five things, they're pretty basic. We also have a state constitution, 
It's really long. The Democrats were in charge for a hundred years in this state. And being a conservative is a lot like being a Christian. The world pulls you in one direction and you have to resist and try to come back. And like we teach our girls, you live in the world, but you're not of the world. But we're not, fall we're not perfect. We're all fallible. I need your help, I need your support, and I look forward to your questions. And we have Dan Ladd. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate the Republican women and the uh, GOP putting this together. And uh, I think there's about 12 of you that are here on your own. The rest are all here supporting candidates. And I appreciate you all being here. But uh, wow, what an introduction she got. I ought to explain the little huddle that's here was uh, Jennifer kindly reminding us the rules and stuff. And you notice that she moves up and lets us know when our time, we have 10 seconds left. And I appreciate Jennifer moderating us and, and gently giving us reminders. Some of us need more reminders than others. She's right. I have pointed out her voting record. Because if her voting record was decent, I would not be here. I'm here because she did not uphold her oath. She doesn't want me to talk about this previously, but today she wants to talk about it. And so I'm glad you got a flyer. Uh, hopefully somebody out there can share one with me so I can see what you've been told and might be able to correct it in the next 20 minutes. My name is Dan Ladd. I've been on boards with AJ here in Guthrie. I have a business here on Wentz, just down the street, half a block. It's an engineering firm called Inline Press. My wife Nancy is here. She married me 31 years ago. She was my first and last double blind date. She was 15, I was 16. We have three grown kids and that's why they're not all here. They're out changing the world. Two of them are missionaries and I really appreciate what they're doing. My son is an instructor in um, international rescue and relief. He's currently teaching search and rescue techniques to students. Uh, he and his wife live in Bethel, or Redding, California and go to Bethel. Uh, my other daughter and her husband are doing a, uh, uh, they've got a group called YWAM, Youth with a Mission, in the Yosemite Valley, and they're, they're uh, ministering to people there the truth of Jesus Christ. And my other daughter is married. She has what we call our four grand sugars, two natural uh, grandchildren and two foster grandchildren, because we see the need for foster parents coming up and impacting lives, and so we've had them move in with us so we could also help raise those children uh, that have been abused. AJ's record isn't good and that's why I'm here. I went to her, Nancy and I met with her, tried talking to her, tried getting her feel on Common Core, tried getting her feel on the United Nations and the Agenda 21 that's so directing our, our state and affecting our farmers and soon to be our businesses and our population. And we cannot tolerate this. After an hour and a half of discussing it with AJ, we couldn't get where she felt. She kept giving the runaround, wouldn't commit on Common Core. She actually spent most of the time telling us how great it was for her two daughters. And I knew that that wasn't acceptable for Oklahoma. We, I had no ambition of running and being a politician. I'm a statesman. I want to be bring change. I have a, a ministry called Father's Heart Ministry. It's a nonprofit. We we go in and we help those that aren't getting help by big organizations. They fall in the crack. They need heat. We find a way to get them heat. They need glasses. They need little things. Um, we help with the food pantries. We we work on a small level because the government doesn't do a good job. AJ's record 73 percent on the conservative ranking, and that's shown in the Oklahoma Constitution paper. We need people that are 100%. She took an oath that she'd be 100%. She took an oath saying she'd uphold the Constitution 100% of the time against all threats, foreign and domestic. She got a 73 on that scale. She, she got an A with the Sierra Club. She voted the way they wanted to every time, showed up for every vote. Jason Murphy got an F. I asked Jason if I could share that. He's proud. He said, could I get lower than an F? I said, no. He says, well, then I got to be happy with an F because that's a bad group. That's why I'm running.
Senator Griffin, uh, the first question is to you. It's good to both of you, but since you were the first to speak, what does con conservatism mean to you? Well, I think I addressed some of that in my, in, and other than being the most overused word in political campaigns, which we can all agree on that, um, what conservatism means is, like I said, the, the world's going to try to pull you one direction, and we're already set up to fail here in Oklahoma. Guys, right down the road at what is now the Masonic Temple was held our Constitutional Convention here in the state of Oklahoma. There were 112 participants, 100 of them were uh, Democrats, 12 were Republicans. So we kind of started out behind, um, and in 100 years, it took us 100 years for Democrats to, take, or to be defeated in this state. And there's women in this room that I know were a big part of this, the change. Um, Janine, you were part of the change and why we're now in control, okay? So I'm more concerned with the word Republican and what it means to be a Republican. Republicans want smaller government. They want lower taxes. Smaller government, lower taxes, more freedom, more liberty, kind of want the government to stay out of our lives. And we're working on that. Now, Representative Davis was in the House all by himself for a really long time, the last elected official from the community of, of Guthrie, and he served in the minority. We are in the majority. This is a great big ship, and it turns very slowly. But with the help of those of us that are working to right-size government, not to completely eliminate it, but right-size it. You know, Representative Murphy discussed some of the um, consolidations that we have done recently. Well, I was the Senate author on several of those. Um, we've consolidated boards. We're bringing those things together. We're shrinking them, shrinking government. That's conservatism. And lower taxes. Lower taxes, trying to get our income tax as low as possible. There's a great publication out called How Money Walks. I encourage all of you to look at How Money Walks. It's going to show how money travels from one state to a state with lower taxes. We're working on it. Doesn't happen overnight. No magic wand. That's What is conservatism? I put some notes because we had that question before and it's significant. I'm sorry. It's important that we know what a conservative is because all the Republicans have called themselves conservative and yet we've just voted in a House leader that's a very moderate. So I'm tired of the people down in the Capitol saying they're conservatives on the campaign trail and then not falling through. Conservative sticks to the Constitution 100% of the time. What conservatives believe in is personal responsibility, limited government, free markets, traditional American values, strong national defense, and individual liberties. Those are pretty simple things. I think part of the problem is us. We call those guys down there lawmakers. And they just make laws, and like Jason was alluding to earlier, we need to have them oversee these laws. We have need to back that thing off. They pride themselves in the fact that they put forth 2,000 laws each year. That's ridiculous. We need to get back to the Constitution. AJ referred to it as having five points. It doesn't. There's 18 enumerated powers that were given in the Constitution. She might have been alluding to the fact that she narrowed them down to five, but she needs to get that Constitution down and needs to vote that way. You need a senator that will consistently do that. You need somebody that knows individuals and serves individuals and does not rule. There's a big difference between serving and ruling. This is a two-part question. How will you push back against the federal government and how will you work to make Oklahoma strong in this, with state constitution rights? Thank you. It's a good question. Thank you for asking. The way that we push back the federal government, and that's what really needs to be done here in Oklahoma, because the D.C. guys 
are way overreaching and are taking away our rights on a daily basis and, given, and we're losing our liberty. So it's a process called nullification. Uh, they've worked it out real well already for the Obamacare penalties. And so if you, you, you walk through, the states have the power to tell the federal government, because we gave the power to the federal government. So we need to tell the federal government, you've overstepped the Constitution on this. This is not a constitutional issue. This is a state level. And we on a state level are going to say no, we do not want this. If that's the Environmental Protection Agency and the way that they're complaining about farm dust and coal powered uh, power plants, that's, that's not good for Oklahoma. So as a state, the sovereign state of Oklahoma, the senators and the governor can then say, hey, we want to push that back. Uh, the second part of the question was, how would I do it? How do you work to make Oklahoma a strong by educating, yeah, by, by educating the Capitol, reminding them of the fact, reminding of the Constitution. There's not a lot of real high-ranking constitutionalists down there. We need to get back to the Constitution. That's When we've gotten away from it is what has caused the problems that we're seeing today. So education of the, the people down in the Capitol and then uh, taking action and being able to remind the federal government their position. Um, the first one was pushed back against the federal government. Uh, the first thing that we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is recognize the fact that we are a recipient state. State of Oklahoma receives more money in federal funds than we send in federal taxes. Let me say that again. We receive more money as a state in federal funds than we pay in taxes. We're a recipient state. That needs to change. The only way to change that is through strengthening the economy in the state of Oklahoma. We're a recipient state because we have a lot of poor people and we have a lot of sick people. That's just a matter of the fact. And my nursing home administrator is shaking her head correct. Yes, a lot of poor people and a lot of, fat, of, of sick people. We need to change the economic landscape of the state of Oklahoma. And then we remove the carrot that the federal government has over us. If we can afford to take care of our own people, we don't need them. It's kind of like an county has enough money to take care of their own roads. They don't need the states meddling in their business. When a city is properly funded, they don't need the county and the state to come on and babysit. So we have to get into a position where as a state, we are the strongest state in the country. We don't need the federal government to apply that carrot to us any longer. Nullification is an option. And I will tell you that the Obamacare penalty nullification that my challenger uh, alluded to has, ha, is a possibility in the state legislature. What we would do when you, if you are ordered by the federal government to pay that Obamacare penalty, you wouldn't. And if you were then fined, then you could take that fine off of your state income tax. We've discussed, about, discussed that hadn't happened yet because quite frankly, Obamacare hasn't materialized quite yet, but it's going to. And the state, at the state legislature, we're ready. We're ready to take appropriate action to protect the people of the state of Oklahoma. Would you support a call for impeachment of President Obama? How many laws does it have to violate before being held accountable? When I said lawmakers don't act on their own, they need a team, we got one in this country that thinks he does, but he can all by himself. Um, there is no doubt that the President has probably made numerous impeachable offenses and that it is appropriate for the House to call for his impeachment. We've got a problem in an impeachment proceedings the Senate, the U.S. Senate, acts as the jury, and we're not in charge. We need to fix that. Folks, we have got to restore power to the White House, to the Republican Party. That's the way we win, is we, we actually literally win. Do you know that Democrats still outnumber Republicans in the state of Oklahoma? In the reddest of the red, we are still the minority. And while the Democrats are selling hope and change, quite frankly, we're selling blame and shame. It's not going to work. If we're going to take it back, we need to take it back by doing what makes sense. We need to win. It 
This is where it's uh, difficult when you're not a politician because I tell you what I think all the time. I'll ask you how you feel and I'll consider that. But you're always going to hear me and it's not always pretty. Senator Jeff Griffin just said that we should have, uh, on the impeachment, he, he's multiple impeachments, absolutely impeach the man. Our House is in charge of putting those charges forward, and they're not because they're saying, oh, well, the Senate's the jury. They should still put those charges forward. The American people are fed up. <laughs> Say thank you. But what the, what the Republic, and I'm sorry, because I know I'm talking to the Republican and GPU people, and yes, we have got problems with our organization, but the reality is, is if we do not call for an impeachment, the people are disgusted with us, and of course they're going over the Democratic Party. There is no difference between the Republicans and Democrats in D.C. They're all voting on the same thing. We've got to, we got to bring it so the American people have a chance to verbalize how disappointed they are. Walking, you hear it. Everybody is fed up. But it's leaning down into the state issues, too. Um, this isn't a state issue, putting, putting him up's not. I'm going to encourage my legislators to do that in the, in the U.S. positions, but as a state we can't impeach him, but we certainly got to encourage our leaders to do that, and even if we don't have a majority in the Senate, at least those senators would have to be seen on how they voted on that, and maybe that'll get, get our nation to change. So let's drive them to, to change. That's where I'm at. What is the most important issue for Oklahoma? As I said before, getting back to the Constitution, which is going to require nullification, it's going to require education, and it's going to require action. I'm hearing candidates using this as talking points. What we need to do is go back and look at our talking points from two years ago and were they upheld? And did they take action? Or did they get down to the Capitol join the good old boy society, get on all their committees because they're a yes vote, and keep everybody down there happy, or are they doing what the people of Oklahoma want them to do in serving the people of Oklahoma? My husband and I have been married 20 years, 22 years, and he has always told me, and I would go, oh, no, no, no. And he would say, Honey, it's about the money. He would say, it's about the money. The most important issue that we have in the state of Oklahoma right now is problems with our budgeting process. Now, these are constitutional in nature because we, that's how we, how we spend our money is how we interpret the Constitution. I mean, you know, just like your family, how you spend your money, that's where your values are. It's what you're spending your money on and your time, but we cost that time, talent, and treasure. Our budgeting process in the state of Oklahoma is broken. It doesn't re reflect our basic core values. If we have a singular problem, the real problem, the biggest issue facing Oklahoma, it's how we write our budget, how we spend your money. And you talk about a elephant that it takes two years to even understand and I'll be honest there are pieces of it I'm still learning and will continue to learn and I started learning before I was ever elected working under these agencies that are spending our money but we have to figure it out we spend enough of your money we don't necessarily spend it on what you want us to so it's time to make the Constitution the way we put it in action, that's how we put it in action. So we spend your money. We need to do a better job spending your money. When should martial law be considered? Should it be an option now? What is your stand on the militias helping the government uphold the Constitution? I would not support going under martial law currently. And militias supporting the Constitution, um, that gets back to our basic fundamental rights um, as Americans to keep arms. Um, very proud of my uh, NRA voting record. And I'm going to be honest, when I was running the first time, um, my, my, my friend Charlie Meadows called me squishy on the Second Amendment. Um, he was probably right at the time. 
because it was based on my personal experience. I didn't grow up hunting and didn't carry a firearm. Um, in two years, I've become a, a huge advocate for Second Amendment rights based on talking to my constituents, listening to stakeholders, and doing the research necessary to make a decision that properly reflects the 20th district. I've been named a Patriot Legislator of the Year by the Second Amendment Association and received confirmation that if re-elected, I will carry the Oklahoma Constitutional Amendment that reaffirms our Second Amendment rights and institutes cautional carry in this state. Looking forward to that because that's what we need. If we are all exercising that right and that freedom, then we have much less to fear from our government. Um, that's how we protect that liberty. We were supposed to be a people that was able to rise up at any given moment and defend ourselves against attacks, foreign and domestic. And that's how we protect that. Um, so I'll continue to do that um, at the state capitol if you give me opportunity to do so. The difference in some of the Second Amendment legislation that I've carried and that some of my colleagues have carried, the big difference is the stuff that I carried passed because I have the ability to work with my colleagues and they like, trust, and respect me. And whenever we're on the floor making those votes, they listen to me. When should martial law be considered? Should it be an option now? What is your stand on the militias helping the government uphold the Constitution? Uh, now I know why she got off track, and I'll probably do the same. But no, martial law should not be declared now. The only people that are standing up are those that want the Constitution reinstated and for us to live by it. So we don't want new martial law. That's trying to uh, slow us down. What we need to do is get involved in the things, and as AJ talked about the pro-life, you know, we're both pro-life, I want you to know that, and uh, I'm just involved in the pro-life movement, I don't just go to their banquets, I'm involved on almost a daily basis with our local crisis pregnancy center. I'm very second amendment, it's not about guns, it's about arms, because it's to defend ourselves from an overreaching federal government. They put that there 200 years ago and a musket was the best they could think of, but they had the foresight. I, think, I believe God gave them the foresight to call it arms. So it's not legislation to hold us to just what our muskets will do. It's so that we can stand up against a, turn air, a, a very bad <laughs> uh, federal government that is, is way overreaching its bounds and is trying to control us. And they are supposed to be working for us. So we need to stand up against that. So the martial law issue is a big concern because it will be declared and it's most likely to be declared against the people in this room than any other group in America at this state by the leadership we have in DC. It's just fun to put the mic down, so that's what <laughs> happens every time. Okay, how do you feel about the recent lowering of the tax ratio for Logan County, the first county to do so since law change in 1996? Thrilled. Everybody's thrilled when taxes go down. The reality check is we've got two more bills coming up that'll be at the special election where they're going to ask for more money and extension money. So the thing is, we're not spending the money wisely. We're taking plenty. So I'm thrilled with the tax cut, but we're going to have to make some very tough decisions. And what it comes down to is government overreach, government doing everything for us. Um, there's a book called um, Not Yours to Give. It's uh, excerpts from Davy Crockett's life. And it tells us that government doesn't have the right to meet a compassionate need. And our government has taken the joy of compassionate giving away from us. They take care of all the needs that the church was really created to do. The Lord set it up so that we would take care of the orphans and the widows, the poor and the needy. But our government now does that. And if the church gets involved, it's that lie about separation of church and state. The state's got to stay out of our religion. That's absolutely true. But we no longer have the freedom to give because they're taking our taxes and they're doing it for us and then they get the credit for it and they do such a terrible job of, of using that money. Their most inefficient system ever created is the way our government takes care of the poor and the needy. We do much better of that. We need to 
to get back to people taking care of the local people through the church, through social organizations, and get the government out of that. The, yes, so I can make sure. How do you feel about the recent lowering of the tax ratio for Logan County, the first county to do so since law change in 1996? I'm going to assume that when they say that, that is the, the lowering of the assessed property value um, that was done by our county treasurer that ro uh, lowered our, your property tax percentage from the, the max of 12 to 11. Um, obviously, I always support lower taxes. And that particular, th I think we could have probably handled that a little bit diff different. Um, obviously, the treasurer was perfectly within her uh, assessor. Okay, thank you, Clark. Uh, uh, Troy, I appreciate that. The county assessor, thank you. Um, not the treasurer, Sherry wouldn't be very happy with me. <laughs> um, we needed to communicate a little bit better with the stakeholders. That was something that, that um, impacted the schools in Logan County. Um, took money immediately out of what they were expecting. I wish we'd have talked about it and had a little more back and forth about the timing of when that had occurred. But other than that, obviously, um, the assessor, would, that was well within our authority. She made the right decision. Anytime that we can lower property property um, taxes and can do that, we should do that. Um, I know that the schools have adjusted and um, they have, have made that change. I know that our count, other county officers that that affected have made the change. Their offices are still um, up and operating. Um, we probably could have done that with a little bit more communication back and forth, but you know, um, I've learned anything in government in a couple of years is that hindsight is definitely 2020, and I have a feeling if all the players could have done things differently, that it probably improved the process. I think my, um, Mr. Ladd also alluded to the potential of an extension of a sales tax increase that is being proposed by the county that would lower the sales tax increase that was voted on 10 years ago from one penny to three quarters of a cent. I'm going to be honest, I haven't studied that enough to weigh in on that at this point. I'm always for lower taxes. This will be the last question for the Senate candidates. What percentage of your campaign funds have come from lobbyists or PACs that employ a lobbyist? Honestly, at this point, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm going to tell you this. This is an extremely expensive process. It really is, especially when you have four counties that you're attempting to cover. And then once you're elected, you still have a lot of expenses. And I will, I took a significant pay cut when I took this job. Plans to have another job so that I could supplement our income. And God's been really good to us, and that hasn't been, well, quite frankly, it hadn't been possible. Um, if you want to know my campaign finances, you're welcome to look at the Ethics Commission report. And by the way, I did carry the legislation that will improve that process, so it'll become even more transparent. Um, I do accept money from PACs. I accept money from individuals that support me and my cause and the things that we're trying to do. It doesn't buy anything at all, maybe a little bit of time. My husband's been trying to buy things for me for a long time. <laughs> He's pretty good at it, too. Um, but. This is part of this process. When those people choose to step up and support me, quite frankly, that's an answer to prayer. My vehicle has 119,000 miles on it, and it is a 2011. Almost every single one of those miles has come traveling these four counties, being out there and doing this work. Salary, isn't all it cra it's cracked up to be. In fact, Alex was teasing me yesterday, and she said, Mom, you can go back to teaching. They make more money than you do. <laughs> which is true. Um, this is not, it's, it's, we don't do this for the money, okay? but I feel very blessed to have the support of a lot of individuals, both groups and individuals. Those PACs represent people, people that are doing a job that want someone who will listen to them about their job, about running a nursing home, about being an optometrist. PACs, are the, they're just people and they're wanting me to listen to them. And I will. What percentage of my campaign came from PACs and lobbyists? <laughs> well, I've got a huge campaign group. Uh, Nancy, <laughs> I think we had uh, five people that gave us $1,000. Three of those, I'll admit, were close family members. And uh, we had two people give us $500. We had uh, 
$5,000 offered to us from a pact, and I said, no, not interested. Uh, she said it's expensive doing this. It can be expensive. If you need to buy your position, it's very expensive. Uh, she mentioned the ethics report. It is out there. Unfortunately, you won't get the updated version until after you voted, so you won't be able to see where what we refer to as the dark money lies. But by the Sierra Club vote that I mentioned earlier, you can probably see where a lot of her contributions came from because she voted and got an A rating with the Sierra Club. If you're like me and my family, the Sierra Club has not helped us at all. Sounds great, they got pretty ads, but they're not good for Oklahoma at all. Small business, agriculture, Sierra Club is the wrong group to party up with and to take funds from. So I have not taken any money. Campaigns cost us, uh, I don't know, Nancy's in charge of numbers, but I think we're about $8,000 that we've put into this total. Is that maybe 9000 So um, not interested in being bought. I really respect Jason Murphy. He went down and put a big old sign on his office door. Lobby money is not accepted and not welcome here. And we've had three other, two in the, where well, there's two representatives and two senators that have chosen to have that too. If you want to be represented by the big money, dark money, you can do that. But if you want your voice to be held, if you're a small business, if you're not all tied up with all the other things, um, you're going to want somebody that doesn't take money from other sources like that. Senator Griffin has requested her one minute rebuttal. Actually, I just want to clarify a couple of things. I've never gotten any money from Sierra Club, and actually, uh, last minute, last session, I had a Sierra Club hit list bill. It was their number one bill they were trying to defeat. It was on distributive energy and the um, the fact that if someone put in a solar panel, it was going to raise your utility rates. So I had a Sierra Club hit list bill last session, and I've never taken a dime. And there is no dark money in Oklahoma. We're in the period of reporting where beginning uh, Monday, everything has to be reported within 24 hours of re receipt. So you can check that reporting every day and see where that stuff comes from. Um, we have some of the best ethics laws in the country, and they actually just got better with this last session um, with some of the things that we were able to pass regarding county and municipal elections, school board elections. They're continuing to get better. And um, we will also, we appropriated a $75,000 to the Ethics Commission and additional funds, so they're going to upgrade their computer system because sometimes it doesn't necessarily provide um, the most accurate picture of what's going on, so they're going to upgrade that. So um, there is no dark money in Oklahoma, maybe at the federal level, but not in state politics.